So good morning, my name is Julie Brigham Gretti, and I'm the chair of the Paleo Paleo Focus Group. And along with Peter Slosser, who is up here also with me today, he's the chair of the Ocean Sciences, our privilege to present the Emiliani Lecture uh, this morning. Before we do that, we have um, just a little bit of, of, of business here. I would like to just remind everyone, uh, if you're not going to the IODP open townhouse, you can come over to the uh, Joint Ocean Sciences Paleo Paleo Reception, which is in the Marriott. Uh, and we will have uh, volunteered from students their presentations flashing up on the wall so you can have some, see some sunshine on some of your students and we'll celebrate uh, the youth of our, of our organization. So I also want to thank um, uh, a number of people that really make this meeting happen, and particularly the program committee. I don't, if you look at that picture behind uh, the text there, I mean, it really is a horse trading game that happens for about two or three days here at AGU when uh, Bob Evan, Rob Evans and uh, Barbara Honish and Matthew Schmidt, and also for in the past, uh, Fegan Mekic, um, really have done a tremendous job trying to organize the, the program. And, you know, um, our hearts go out to them. If you see them, I'd like them to stand up, actually. Please stand up. Um, if you see these people in the hallway. <laughs> um, typically, I mean, we work for cookies, so. Um, uh, please show some appreciation for them. And also I want to appreciate, we had a, um, a call for nominations to the executive committees of both of, our, of the uh, Ocean Sciences and Paleo Paleo, and then this group of people all uh, then vetted the nominations. And so you'll see uh, that process. And we also thank them for uh, their deliberations on that. So today we want to celebrate um, really uh, the accomplishments in our, in our field, and particularly um, uh, reflect on, on the amazing work of uh, uh, Cesare Emiliani and what he brought to us. He studied geology in the University of Bologna in Italy, got his PhD in paleontology, and then he actually went on after World War II to get a second PhD, how many of us do that, uh, at the uh, University of Chicago uh, under Harold uh, Urey, where, and this is where he really did his landmark work uh, describing the composition of carbon and oxygen is isotopes in, in uh, carbonate tests. He was really the first to realize that these compositions can act as, a, as tape recorders in the ocean and climate change as proxies for temperature and salinity. And uh, he eventually then moved in 1957 to the University of Miami and he uh, and joined the group, of course, later called the Rosenthal School of o uh, Marine and, and Atmospheric Sciences, where he started to really work on, on sediment cores. He was instrumental in starting JOIDES, and he actually started the Department of Geosciences at the University of Miami, Coral Gables, where he was the um, chair until 1993. He received the coveted uh, Swedish uh, Geographical Society Vega Medal in 1983. And also, students should know, uh, if you haven't heard of the Cacolithophorid Emiliani Huxii, is, or E. Hux, as it's sometimes referred to, was actually named for him uh, by Bill Hay. Professor Emiliani inspired and, and instilled excitement in the ocean sciences and the legacy that we celebrate today. We celebrate that today with, um, oh, and I want to mention, too, the, the, um, this uh, presentation is being recorded, and many of the past um, lectures have been recorded, and I encourage the students uh, in particular to go back uh, on the uh, uh, AGU website and really uh, enjoy many of these past lectures. So this is our 13th Emiliani lecture, and I'm, we're uh, very uh, honored to present uh, the Emiliani lecture by, by Professor Harry Helderfield. Uh, Professor Elder, Elderfield was a marine geochemist who has a remarkable career suggests he really enjoyed two careers. His work first evolved from the studies of hydrothermal fluid flow through ocean crust and sediments to studies of trace elements in seawater. He was among the first low temperature geochemists uh, to value how radiogenic isotopes might be used to solve problems of the marine geochemistry developing seawater uh, strontium isotope curve for the Cenozoic. More recently, his pioneering research has focused on the development of trace metal and isotopic studies in planktonic and benthic foraminifera as a means of understanding ocean and biogeochemical cycles, in other words, how the glacial interglacial cycles uh, really work. 
He has championed the development of the magnesium-calcium ratios as an innovative paleothermometer for interpreting ocean cores and providing a means of untangling the influence of, of temperature versus ice volume in marine records to better link them with air temperature and ice core data. His benchmark work on the preservation of calcium carbonate and interglacial changes in carbonate reservoir histories has also informed us about the past and present processes of ocean acidification, that other CO2 problem. And I'm sure that there's probably several laboratories in this country where every grad student has this figure pasted up over their office uh, desk. Harry Elderfield is a part of a robust climate change group at the and the Department of, G of Earth Sciences at Cambridge University. And it's a great privilege to ask him to, this morning to give the Emiliani Lecture. Help me welcome him this morning. Well, <laughs> thank you very much and uh, good morning. It's, uh, you're producing a lot of CO2 out there, I think. First of all, I want to thank the um, PP Focus Group and the Ocean and Sciences Selection Committee for um, me being here. And um, you read, heard all the names, and I think uh, you mentioned Peter Swart was one of them. Pe Peter has been very helpful. He said that would I send um, him a photograph of myself, because the only one that he'd got was one that was probably illegal and was taken by Ros Rickaby at a student party. <laughs> so before this appears, I'll tell you that I f had a choice of roles. And one idea was for me to go as a woman. And I thought that uh, there may be issues surrounding that. So I ended up hiring an Elvis Presley outfit. <laughs> and. Um, the party was quite good. I th the, one of the problems was I didn't really have enough black chest hair. <laughs> so I had to remove this from some wool that my wife had and stick it on with glue. Um, of course, some glues are more difficult to remove than others. And so for my lectures the following week, I wore quite a lot of clothes zipped up to the top. Anyway. Um, so. I'm just going to get my pointer out. So I think this is um, an appropriate um, image with which to start. We've heard about Emiliani, and um, we've also you um, heard Harold Urey's name mentioned, and I'll come to that again. And they played a pivotal role in thinking of traces or proxies that we would use in paleoceanography. So who is this person exactly? <laughs> so this is uh, Jerry Wasserberg. And you wouldn't think that there's a lot of relevance to the three of them being together, but there is. At the left here is a paper that uh, Don Pete Brask and uh, Wasserberg wrote in 1980 showing the differences between the neodymium isotopic composition of waters in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So we now we kind of turn the clock forward quite a lot, and neodymium isotopes are now used as a proxy, a successful proxy of ocean circulation and maybe something else as well. And this is a, a plot from a paper by Alex Piotrowski showing mixing lines between a North Atlantic deep water end member, which would be isotopically like the blue here, and a Pacific deep water end member here. So I'll come on to that um, a little later. So what I'm going to do is do a short introduction to proxies and do it pretty quickly, I think. And then I want to talk about um, paleothermometry using oxygen isotopes and using magnesium calcium ratios. And then finally, I'm going to um, not um, give a sort of detailed science talk, but show some, I think, highlights of some work that I've been involved in for a while, looking at 
uh, long-term records of temperature and ice volume and thinking a little bit about the mid-Pleistocene climate transition. So the first thing we want to ask is, what on earth is a proxy? This is not the lab in Cambridge, I have to uh, confess. This is um, the, uh, the science laboratory on the HMS Challenger. Um, and basically, the idea is that paleoceanographers really want to be physical or chemical oceanographers. And there are things in the modern oceans that we use to understand about climate, productivity, and all these things. But in the past, the direct measurements, with you know, one, probably one, or maybe two important exceptions, are not available to us. So we measure things within an archive, which in this case is going to be foraminiferal calcite, that help us to define these unobservable variables. And of course, um, this seems a little bit sort of formal and prescribed, but obviously we need to understand the rules by which we transform the the, the, the proxy, proxy into something that we can use. And this is usually involved with a, some sort of algorithm, maybe calibration. And traditionally, one proxy has been associated with, say, forum calcite or, or corals. But increasingly, people are realizing that having some sort of multi-proxy approach is a good thing. And in the way is inevitable, because this really is what the record is telling us. And a crucial aspect of the application is that we have to be pretty confident that we can transform the proxy and also the kind of what I would call the sort of x-axis issue. We have to be equally confident we know actually what the age is of the ocean that we're trying to understand and the temporal resolution of, of, of this. So, um, if you haven't delved into the literature and you do so, you'll see there are lots, lots of proxies. And this sort of confidence chart that um, Julie showed you at the end was just kind of a, uh, an idea that we try these things out and sometimes they don't do very well and sometimes they're successful if we take a kind of realistic attitude to things. If we wanted to look at paleo productivity, we might find then we've got proxies of sort of export production and also pro proxies actually tell us about the nutrients in the oceans. And then within these boxes, lots of different versions of, of these. So it's a bit different. At one level, it's really complicated, but at another level, there are kind of two different types of proxy. One tells us by looking at the marine geological record about processes that have happened in the past. You know, the accumulation of organic carbon in sediments, maybe percent calcium carbonate, um, various things like that. And I would say that goes back, I mean, maybe earlier than this, but the pivotal work is the Swedish deep sea expedition in the late 1940s, where for the first time, this cora by Cullenberg was used to get these long sequences of, of deep sea sediments. And it was found, and this is something that Arrhenius used um, then modern dating methods to show that there were these cycles of calcium carbonate present in the sediments. And um, based on ideas what the ages were, these could be correlated over a very wide range. And it was found that the cycles were synchronous and followed glacial, glacial cycles of the Pleistocene. And this is what Wolf Berger said um, a little later about this. The discovery of these features stands at the beginning of the revolution of our understanding of the ice ages. 
here was evidence that climatic change is cyclic and that the ocean's carbon cycle is intimately involved in the glacial and interglacial um, climatic fluctuations. Perhaps I would just go back to say that I think this is a good example of what is now would be deep sea drilling has played in understanding climate both in the past and the future. And it seems extraordinary how some of our leaders, political leaders, just, and also some people, certainly in the UK, in funding agencies, seem to have forgotten you know, how important paleoclimatology and paleoceanography is, you know, how important the records that people have, uh, have produced from, from Arrhenius um, onwards. So the second type is the one that um, I find fascinating. It's the proxy that allows us to kind of inspect seawater to find out what is the composition of the seawater, what's its temperature, what's its nutrients. Because this is the thing that's really most linked to chemical oceanography and physical oceanography. Um, and um, uses um, uh, um, calcitic organisms, the most important of which um, are foraminifera, which are the single cell organisms of the title. And because we can look at planktonic and also benthic foraminifera, it gives us um, uh, a lot more flexibility to um, when we, we apply these things. So I'm now going to give a sort of short history of where we are, I think, um, where we've been and where we are with this before I go on to this example. So um, Harold Urey um, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1934 for his discovery of deuterium. And so we now see him in 1946. Um, after having been preoccupied for a previous period. And he gave a lecture in London at the Royal Institution called the Liversidge Lecture. And um, what he did was to um, present calculations which relate to the thermodynamic properties of isotopic substances. And the, the paper is quite extraordinary um, this is an example of one of the many tables showing for a... Uh, it, uh, if you had it in front of you, it would be difficult to read it, so I appreciate you can't re read this. For different temperatures, the exchange reactions are given and the partition, uh, what we would call isotope exchange um, uh, constants are given. And in the paper, he says that his calculations suggest investigations of particular interest to geology. And he showed then that the, um, that the isotopic composition of carbonate should change by about four per mil relative to water over 0 to 25 degrees Celsius. And he said that mass spectrometers at that time should, would be able to measure the temperature to about 12 degrees Celsius, but with some advances, it would be possible to do it to six degrees, which should be very satisfactory error considering the times to which they may refer. <laughs> so we can do quite a lot better. So this essentially is the reaction, the exchange of, of O18 between water and calcium carbonate, and we have alpha, the fractionation factor, which is a function of temperature. So, um, the first thing then was uh, a paper in Science um, where he, where Yuri compared the um, isotopic fractionation relative to this mollusk, this um, Holiotis refucens, and shown the temperature range. And next, um, uh, Yuri published a paper in Science, and I wonder how 
um, I saw Jesse Smith in the audience, how he would have reacted had a paper been submitted to him with three analyses <laughs> over 35 million years that happened to fall on a straight line. Anyway, the next paper was fantastic. So what Emiliani did was analyze um, the oxidized topic composition of four species of planktonic foraminifera. And I've highlighted one here, which is G. ruba, which is the warmest, and one of the globritalids, Monardini, which is one of the coolest. And this was over, I think, about seven meters. And he could show then these temperature fluctuations um, for the warm species and the cold species. And this was interpreted as glacial interglacial temperatures. And um, this, he plotted here a coarse fraction, which basically was the percentage of um, calcium carbonate um, uh, as defined by Arrhenius. And you can see by comparing it with um, uh, stacks for benthic forearms, and here is the Zekian Ramo stack in green, and also data from a core from off New Zealand that I'm going to talk about in a little while. And you can see then this is stage five, this is stage seven, nine, 11. So it's really, really remarkable to produce a record of this quality and detail for all these species at, at that time. However, a problem emerged. And the problem was called Nick Shackleton. In 1967, when Nick was, I think, about 30, he had the idea of um, measuring the isotopic composition of the benthic foraminifera in the core or cores that Emiliani had measured for planktonic foraminifera. So he reassessed these temperatures. And the, and the temperatures in the previous slide correspond to glacial interglacial surface water temperatures of about six, eight degrees Celsius. So this is, it's a rather strange plot in, the, in, in, this is nature paper, in this paper. So this is a kind of interglacial value. And maybe I'll put on the next slide here. Um, so this is the planktonic range. And the range is about two per mil. I, I can't quite see this very well, minus two to zero. And the glacial range is also two per mil. Now, the sensitive routine to temperature is about 0.25 per mil to degree centigrade. If you remember the equation, the linear version, T equals 16.9 minus four delta C minus delta W. Four is the reciprocal of the sensitivity of 2.25. Now, what Shackleton found was this range was the same in benthic forms as planktonic forearms. And so it would imply that the de if, this was, if this interpretation was correct, um, the deep water of the Caribbean would have been frozen. It was just impossible that that could be the case. So Shackleton realized then that it was a record of terrestrial glaciation or ice volume. And at the end of his paper, he uh, wrote the sentence, which is, was really kind of typical of Nick and his kind of generosity to, to other people by saying that it should be emphasized that the time sequence that Emiliani had been able to obtain remains of inestimable value and in a sense is more important than, than Shackleton's, is enhanced by the certainty that, that it's a time sequence for terrestrial glacial events rather than oceanographic events. 
So I would sort of wondered why he, um, uh, Emiliano was very keen on just saying O18 was temperature and control. This is um, page 562, is the first page of, of Yuri's um, uh, paper based on the Liveridge lecture. But when we get to page 579, um, even Nobel Prize winners can be wrong. What he said was the oxygen of the oceans constitutes a very large reservoir and hence has not changed its isotopic composition with time. Then at the bottom here, on the same page, the oxygen isotope abundance seems to be best suited for determination of temperatures. First, there is a large reservoir of oxygen in the oceans which cannot have changed its isotopic concentration due to logical time. And of course, this then has led through various permutations to um, kind of products, if I can use that word like this, which is this lovely benthic 18 stack by Lezeki and Ramo. The interpretation that the 18 is associated with the development of northern hemisphere glaciation and the fact that the benthic 18 is commonly used as a proxy of global ice volume and for stratigraphic correlation. And I would say, which I think um, is obvious, but will become obvious, that it is not um, only a proxy of global ice volume. Despite what Shackleton said, there's a number of papers actually of his where he uses this rather sort of emotive um, phrase, Benthico 18 records are heavily contaminated by temperature. Um, as a result of this, various people have tried different methods to try and kind of separate these two components of the 18 of calcite. One was to go to um, polar regions where temp the temperature change would be very small and therefore you could um, use the O18 of calcite and, and um, separate the two terms. Also using sea level in O18 of calcite. And also in a quite astonishing paper, I think by Shackleton in 2000, using the O18 in atmospheric oxygen to devolve the, t the two. And in this paper, um, he acknowledges that the, the benthic 18 uh, uh, shows the 100 kilo cycle, but then he says the benthic marine record is heavily contaminated, um, but then he, he, he tries to separate the, um, the different components. And in his paper, this plot here shows what he has um, separated by looking at the the residual, these two residuals, and looked at the difference between the residuals and um, calibrated this in delta W units. So this is about one per mil. So this implies that the deep sea temperature change is about four degrees in this record. But it's kind of clear that this sort of messing around was not going to get anywhere and that it was necessary to come up with um, another way of, of, of defining temperature. And I think this, the, the people involved, there's a number of people involved, some of whom are in this room, I think would say that one of the driving forces were in, inorganic experiments like this Umori one, where uh, one could see that the magnesium calcium ratio of, of calcite precipitation varied with temperature with about a 3% increase per degree Celsius. Oops. So the idea then was to apply this to biogenic calcite to derive temperature that would allow one then to pull out the IT in of seawater. Now, it's strange that it turns out, and um, Steve Barker, who I saw is in this room, um, uh, found this paper that Emiliani looked at magnesium in the same year of that beautiful paper. So he measured all these different elements in forearms and 
plotted them against aluminium as an index of contamination. And you can see that magnesium, iron, manganese and silicon fell into that category. And he said then, they're completely no use for determining magnesium and calcium ratios because of contamination. And strontium was the only one that was really present in forums. Well, a lot's happened since then, and I'm not going to, I haven't put the authors on these various calibrations because a lot of people have been involved in this in different laboratories. But basically, um, biogenic calcite has been um, uh, um, uh, calibrated uh, foraminiferal, I beg your pardon, uh, uh, plant planktonic foraminiferal calcite has been investigated using cultures, um, caught up sediment traps. And um, it turns out that it, the biogenic calcification is such that there's about a 9% incre increase in magnesium calcium per degree Celsius. I managed to find about 21 calibrations, and this is a little histogram. So the difference is it is different from inorganic values, and there's this whole area of understanding biogenic calcification that is really important and um, but um, needs to be resolved. We don't, we don't know why there is this 9 or 10 percent um, variation. Now one aspect of this which is um, both useful but also complicating is, that of, is really to say we're measuring a temperature but what is that temperature? Is it sea surface temperature? Is it the temperature of habitat depth, uh, seasonality, or whatever? Because, of course, the temperatures that can be then derived would vary quite significantly. And this c can cause problems when one tries to consolidate um, measurements of proxies um, on different archives. So this is um, something from um, a group called Margo that's produced glacial interglacial temperature differences from diatoms, dinoflagellates, forearms, radiolaria, magnesium calcium, and uh, alkanotes. And um, it is very challenging, but, but um, it's also important that we understand the relationships between these different temperatures. And it's something that you know, I think still happens that the modeling community really want to know how reliable are our measurements. And for that, we do need to understand the relationships between the temperature that's obtained by these different archives. When, these, when the calibrations were um, applied to benthic forearms, the problems became, um, have become more complicated. Um, these are plots from a paper by Pamela Martin, who showed that um, contrary to this 10% change in magnesium calcium with temperature, something funny was happening um, at low temperatures, and she had data that kind of fell off this line. There was a point here from one particular region, and um, which suggested that there's some really strong secondary influences. And I did some work with some colleagues where we basically were able to confirm what Pamela had, had shown, that, there, that it, it seemed to be difficult to get correlations for benthic forearms. And we hy hypothesized that this was because of the effect of um, the saturation state of the carbonate ion, which is the difference between the measured value and the um, saturation value, that, that this was affecting the um, magnesium calcium ratio. And there'd been hints of this in the past. There was um, a paper by Tom Marquito that showed that there was a saturation state effect for zinc and cadmium, and I think uh, Yair Rosenthal had showed something um, similar. And in a way, this is logical, 
This is a plot of, um, I think it's GLODAP hydrography, where we're looking at bottom water temperature against carbonate saturation. And the gradient of this is sort of for waters, let's say, down to about two or three degrees, quite shallow. But of course, then you can't really get much colder. And so the gradient the, in this region, the changes in carbonate saturation are very large compared to the changes in temperature. And you can kind of subtract the temperature component and you end up with um, a strong sensitivity of magnesium calcium to carbonate iron. So this is an example where you know, we really need to know what benthic temperatures are, but we've somehow got to deal with this issue that there may be uh, important secondary effects. So um, an idea that we've been looking at is to see whether we can sort of get around this by looking at infaunal rather than epifaunal benthic species, which are the normal ones that one could use. And the sort of idea behind this is that these are some poor water versus, uh, poor water versus depth profiles from a modeling paper by Martin and Sales. So there's a site here which, where the bottom waters are supersaturated. So that would be the bottom waters. If you can see my green pointer, and this would be the, the I beg your pardon, the, and yes, this is, what, have I done this right? Okay, no, uh, that shouldn't be, the bottom water is here, I've made a mistake. And this is the saturation concentration. So um, at the sea floor, the site is supersaturated, but you can see then that with depth to about one or two centimeters, you get to saturation. And if you look at an undersaturated site, um, the same thing happens. It increases to saturation. So although these sites would have differing carbonate iron, the delta carbonate would be zero. So the idea then is there should be no carbonate effect. Now, of course, this is, you know, this is a simplification of the real world, and it depends a lot on carbonate mineralization, um, carbon mineralization, where this occurs, and so on. But anyway, following this approach, then, the idea was to look at infaunal species. This is a plot of the carbon isotope composition of pore waters at a number of sites, and the, the depths of which different infaunal species were present. And I'm not sure you can see this, but there's one of these which is called Euvigerina um, or Euvigerina peregrina, which is a shallow infaunal. And the idea then was that this could be used to, um, for um, studying uh, bottom water temperatures. And this here then is a calibration uh, where the red lines correspond to a paper oops, by, um, from um, Tom Marquiso's lab and, and other points that we've measured that seem to indicate that this issue is not present. But I think none of these things is going to be completely perfect. Okay, so now I want to go on and show um, not a sort of complete story, but aspects of some work that, that is close to completion where we've been looking at a, a record um, for about the past 1.5 million years um, surrounding the mid-Pleistocene transition. And one of the main things we've been trying to do is to separate the ice volume and temperature components of um, the benthic uh, 18 record. So I'm going to, first of all, just in, give a brief introduction, say something about the marine Pleistocene transition and about the core we've been working on, ODP 1123 and Chatham Rise, and then show the magnesium calcium based, um, based t deep sea temperature using the informal species and um, separation of the temperature and seawater components of O18. Say something about the timing and constraints on the mid-Pleistocene transition. And then finally, 
talk about Delta C13 and the sources of organic carbon at the MPT. So this is the Benthico 18 stack of Lezik and Remo again. And I think this is known to most people in this audience, so I'll say this fairly quickly, that this fundamental change that occurred between about 1250 and 650,000 years ago, where the period of glacial interglacial climate changed from 41,000 to 100,000 years in the absence of significant change in orbital forcing. And this is seen in this benthic record by the increase in deep ocean sediment oxygen isotopes, which represents the combined effects of um, decreasing temperature and increasing ice volume. So these effects are kind of going in the same sense. And there's lots of characteristics. There's a really nice review by Peter Clark in, I think, 2006 about this. So I'm not going to read all these things out. But f for example, the, at this time, the Delta C13 became the most depleted over the past five years. There was something kind of interesting at 900 kilojoules uh, and various other things. And no one has really been able to explain this, and it's not my intention to try and do so, although at the end I'll say something that perhaps moves us a bit in that direction. One is there's some sort of threshold response to long-term cooling, which could be related to decreasing CO2. The, another idea is the, the ability of the North American ice sheets to, to survive insulation maxima, and then there's the um, Clark and Pollard regolith hypothesis, which is a kind of weathering. Um, it's related to long-term uh, weathering. So we've looked at a site in the southwest Pacific Ocean um, on something called the Chatham Rise, which is under um, what's called the deep western boundary current, which is this little yellow arrow that's zooming around here. And about half the flux of the cold bottom water entering the basins of the world ocean does so in this region through the southwest Pacific as this um, boundary current, which transports mainly circumpolar deep water. And um, you know this is drawn to the surface by upwelling and then there's a return flow to the south as Antarctic bottom water and as Antarctic intermediate water to the north. So I think it's an interesting re re region for us to look at um, the sort of Pacific end member of circumpolar deep water and make comparisons with the, um, some of the ice core records. One other, well, two other things that are kind of relevant or interesting for um, for this site. This is a hydrographic section, and these are the, um, the different water masses. This is called lower circumpolar deep water, and this is upper circumpolar deep water. And in the middle of this, and so this is like the modern hydrography, there's a very small anomaly of North Atlantic deep water. So I just wanted to point this out for what comes later, that in the kind of interglacial or in the Holocene, there's very small, only very small contributions of NADW. The other thing is that this site is one of the sites that, w that was used by um, At Atkins et al. to derive salinity temperature NO18 of the glacial ocean from modeling pore waters. So one of the sites was um, th uh, this site, and so we have, I so we know or we have knowledge of the glacial um, temperature and glac glacial O18. That I'll, sh I'll show later. Okay, so this is then I want to talk about the temperature record, briefly about calibration and separation of the temperature and seawater values. So at the top then, this is the Benthico 18 data. Um, green was the Zeke and Remo stack, and the, the, the blue and red are from this um, ODP core. 
I've just drawn some lines on to um, orientate you. And below this then is the uh, magnesium calcium ratio and temperature record. There's, this goes back to 1.5 million. There's a little issue that we've discovered here that we're trying to sort out and it could be that there's a species effect from Euvigerina peregrina to something which is called Euvigerina, uh, um, I've forgotten to call it now, um, pygmy eye. That may, so we're just trying to sort this out. So for, I think the obvious thing to say then is that these things look different. You can see from the benthic 18 record, the glacial value stepped down. And you know, we've known this before, obviously. Um, but there's no hint of that in the temperature record. And look, you know, in, in a sort of long scale view of this, the significant aspect of the deep sea temperature record are these warm interglacials going to cooler interglacials. And of course, this is exactly what we see in the ice core record, deuterium. So this is um, comparing the deep sea temperature record from Chatham Rise with um, the deuterium. And I've just scaled both of these records to uh, a mean and plus or minus four um, standard deviations. And they're both on EDC, which is the ice core scale. And you can see these are very similar. Um, the a cross plot has a slope of two. So this would be using the ice core parlance, a kind of polar amplification of, of two. And this is um, a planktonic record from circumpolar deep water over in the Cape Basin, which looks similar. This is um, a modeling um, uh, exercise by Bintania et al. in 2005, which looks similar. So this is sort of one of the, I think, the Antarctic air temperature, or let me put it slightly differently. Um, there's been some modeling work published in the Journal of Climate early, early this year, which describes um, deep sea temperatures as a linear mixture of um, air temperatures, um, of Antarctic bottom water and of North Atlantic deep water. And so this kind of fits into this, this idea um, f for the, the deep sea temperature at Chatham Rise. Okay. So the next thing then is to um, take the temperature and the calcite O18 to derive the delta O18 of seawater. And um, I think maybe I'll miss the rest of the slide. It's just really um, an explanation of uh, how we work on the sensitivities of O18 and magnesium calcium to temperature, and also make some decisions about um, the O18 of ice and, and so on. But I'll, I'll miss that out just to be quick. One other thing we can do, though, is to um, check the calibration with the pore water data that I mentioned before, but also check it by comparing it with sea level or, um, from corals. And this top panel here then shows in blue is the Chatham Rise um, uh, record of seawater O18, which has been you know, derived from temperature and calcite O18, and compared it with sea level um, data from corals in red. And then at the bottom is a more complicated version of this that, that shows um, d data from sim simulation, which is now in blue. The Chatham Rice data is now in green, and I've plotted it for different ratios of the sensitivity of oxygen and uh, magnesium to temperature. And this gives you a kind of idea of um, the accuracy or precision of the, these methods. And I think the bottom line is that this is not a high precision record of sea level because of uncertainties in some of the constants that, that convert magnesium 
and O18 to temperature. Um, and there's also the Red Sea data in red. So, but nevertheless, I think this is um, you know, encouraging and it led us then on to um, derive a, a record for seawater 18. Okay, and this is what it looks like. Now, this is a little bit complicated in that First of all, it's plotted as cold upwards, whereas we're all related, you know, in our minds, to think of cold downwards. And what I've plotted here then is also I've plotted temperature in delta units. So both um, delta C is then the O18 of calcite, delta W is the O18 of water, and delta T is, well, it's the temperature, but in delta units. I hope you understand what I mean by that. So this then in two panels. The top panel compares the temperature record going cold upwards. So this is warmer, colder. So these, this is going with less ice to more ice. And then at the bottom panel, the similar thing where we're comparing the delta W with the delta C. So what I'm going to do is just sort of point at a couple of these things, really. It's a bit difficult at this angle that I'm at. So let's just take, let's say, stage 16. So this is then stage 17. So we start um, the beginning of a glacial cycle. And what happens then? We see rapid warming. And then the temperature kind of stays more or less at that value. But during this period, there's been very little change in, um, in ice volume. So it's telling us what we probably already knew, that we've got um, uh, rapid temperature, rapid cooling, but a much slower formation of, of ice sheets. And so the proportions of temperature and, um, and ice volume to benthic 18 obviously change through the glacial cycle. At the start of the cycle, the delta W in ice volume is about 10% of the benthic 18 and temperature is about 90%. But at the glacial maximum, the, the water 18 is about 60% and temperatures are only about 10%. Now, the situation in the part of the curve where we're looking at obliquity cycles is something I haven't really sort of got to grips with yet. But it's pretty clear, I think, for the eccentricity cycles, we're seeing this pattern. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is that you know, we, when we see the, temp the initial cooling, that it looks as though we've got a kind of square wave pattern for temperature rather than this sort of dog tooth pattern that we're seeing for um, benthic um, cal calcite 18. So um, it looks as though the temperature records are truncated. So this could be um, a reflection that we're cooling the bottom waters almost to freezing. And of course, this has been suggested from the poor water data. And I'm going to show this at the end of my talk just to make a, a, a further comment. Are we OK? Am I OK? Just, yeah, OK. So this is plotting the um, seawater 18 in a more conventional way. And I think you know, what we saw from the first of these plots is that clearly there's an abrupt change in ice volume over 18 at around 900 kilo years.
So this is just blowing it up. And so, um, so this is stage 25, 24, 23, 22. So I would say th this is the mid Pleistocene transition. Now, in um, Peter Clark's review, um, he made an interesting comment which he applied to the Benthic 18 record that applies more to this. That if we look at this um, period of this record, it looks familiar. And what it looks like, it looks like the last interglacial cycle. So 25 looks like MS5, 24 looks 4, 3, 2, and 1. So it's really interesting. So it's obviously there's some sort of implications there for, for, for stage 3, or rather stage 23. And so this would be a really interesting region to look at, to look for uh, ice rafted effects and so on. Um, okay, I've forgotten what I was going to say here. Okay, um, let me just go back. Okay, right. So, okay, shall I just talk a bit louder? <laughs> um, so, one obvious question then is what causes this? And Look, going back to the temperature record, it seems then there's no, it seems there's no reflection in temperature of this large step in ice volume. So what else might be responsible? Well, one, one idea in the literature is that it's CO2. What I've plotted here then is the, the bottom part of the Epica CO2 record, and I've added some uh, uh, CO2, CO2 data from Bubble Honish's paper. And so, certainly, uh, clearly, we need more CO2 um, records in this region. But it's interesting, again, then, that over this region, and I'm just using one point here, one point here, that this, this change corresponds to a 90 ppm CO2 uh, change. Okay, so um, finally, or knee finally then, something about carbon isotopes. Um, in many records, we see this pattern of um, the delta C13, benthic delta C13, and it's been pointed out that there's this at 900 kilojoules, which I would argue is the mid Pleistocene transition. We get this minimum in delta C13, and I think this is um, someone pointed out. This is the lowest value that's been that's been recorded, like over about a five million year period. Um, so the ideas behind this might be a whole ocean change, a change in productivity, or a change in ocean circulation. So the question really then is, are we looking at like this change or something smaller? So one idea that uh, is being suggested by Maureen Ramo uh, is of increasing aridity at this time. Another idea, which I, I think is a uh, a really interesting idea is that you know, this, following this, we've got this um, you know, seawater fall such that um, organic carbon that is, is, that is stored on shelf and upper slope sediments is exposed. And it's been exposed for the first time for millions of years. So this has potential to uh, being the source of the organic carbon. But it is quite complicated because clearly, is, you know, the question is, is this also associated with inorganic carbon, you know, you know there's a coral reef hypothesis. Um, and of course, um, 
with compensation, it, they, well, first of all, it would increase CO2, but with compensation, it wouldn't change it very much. If you look at local productivity, we are using an informal species which would or could well show poor water influence. What we've done is, for part of this record, we've measured Uvidriana, which is the informal species, and um, Sibicidoides, which is um, epibenthic. And um, these are compared at this part of the record, and the correlation is excellent. And basically, the Uvidriana and, uh, and um, Sibicidoides are offset by 0.9. So I don't think there's any local productivity issues. So, um, we're actually now returning to Jerry Wasberg and Lee Deming isotopes. So, um, can we explore the circulation oops, um, by looking at neodymium? So, what we've got here is from um, Alex Piotrowski, um, a compa comparison of the neodymium isotopes versus silicate as an indicator of kind of the um, of water masses, and this is this plot I showed you before from Alex, where neodymium is there's a mixing line between um, North Atlantic deep water and um, and um, Pacific deep water, and also I'm showing here then the um, del C13 for um, G6 data compared with um, the last glacier maximum simulation by um, Bill Curry. So, um, what we thought we'd do as a kind of pilot study was to um, generate some needed isotope data for three kind of sections in this long core. One is at the, oops, my point is, just, okay. 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 I, I probably don't need it actually. Um, one for the deglaciation, one for an eccentricity cycle at the top. You can see stage 11, and also for a obliquity cycle to um, to see to what extent then is the carbon isotopes um, linked to or related to um, circulation changes. Could use the mouse too. Yeah, yes. And so um, what we see in all these cases then is that there's a correlation between neodymium and carbon isotopes. So superficially then this is circulation, but it's more complicated than that. So what I've done here then is um, we've, we've basically plotted the data on a cross plot of neodymium as a kind of x-axis and delta C13. Also shown are the mixing lines, um, which are non-linear non mixing lines between NADW and, um, and, and the Pacific end member. And you can see that the data from the, that I showed you before Ha, uh, doesn't fall on these lines, but falls at a kind of angle across them. And the ones at the bottom show the, the glacial iced up stages that I showed you in those previous plots. Um, and the ones at the top are the interglacial. As you can see in green, 37 at the top, then it goes down to 36, and then 35, and so on. So we've got a gradient which shows these glacial into glacial cycles, but they're not falling on that line here. And what they're doing then, they're falling kind of on a line that's defined by two vectors, one of which is circulation, and the other of which is a whole ocean effect. And so you can see then there's a component of this, this data set that reflects um, lower delta C13 at glacial times, and the offset, depending on which of these cycles we looked at, is about 0.4 or maybe 0.5 uh, 
um, per mil, and then a circulation component which um, fits these two um, mixing curves. And of course, what we haven't done is to do this at, um, uh, at, at stage um, 22, which would be really interesting. So I can point you, if I may, to um, a talk by or a post by Alex tomorrow afternoon, who, who has some other insights into this. OK, um, finally, very finally, um, th this um, shows the um, a wavelet analysis of the data from this site. And you can see in the red line here, this um, 100 kilo power emerging at about 1250. There's a little gap. And then there's renewed power at about 900. And this is exactly what Clark et al. talked about at length in their review. So these are some filters. And I just wanted to show them just briefly to say that um, if we just ignore the obliquity filter at the bottom for eccentricity, that um, temperature is, um, um, is leading ice volume in um, th this part of this record uh, at, at, at the older part, which I'm not quite sure about yet. But so um, temperature is leading ice volume. So one sort of further thought about these um, square wave records is that, first of all, the cooling that we see in this red curve is cooling the ocean to near freezing. And so maybe the, um, the record where I argue that it didn't look like delta W is not really um, valid. But also, the cold temperatures pers persist. So as well as cooling um, to the, the, this is the red curve, cooling to that red line, um, we see in the eccentricity cycles that the cooling is persisting over most of the cycle. So this doesn't um, really explain the mid Pleistocene transition, but it does go towards seeing why this sort of um, cooling and persistent cooling could lead to the buildup of, of um, uh, large ice sheets. OK, I'm going to stop now. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of this lecture and also um, the people in Cambridge who, with whom I've worked. Um, and I'm just going to read them out because they've all played a great role in this. Patricia Ferretti, Mervyn Greaves, Simon Crowhurst, Nick McCabe, Dave Hodell, Alex Piotrowski. And we've got some terrific technicians. Uh, Linda, who is our micropaleontologist, Caroline Daunt, Salima, and Sam. And we've been funded, I wouldn't say generously, but on and off. <laughs> by the Natural Environment Research Council, the Royal Society, the League of Human Trust, the European Union, uh, particularly the European Research Council that have been giving me quite a nice um, funding, and the University of Cambridge. So thank you very much indeed for listening. We have time for a few questions, and I'd ask that you stand and shout loudly and also wave your hand, because we, the lights are right into our faces, so I can't see you very easily. Any questions?
they feel that biology is playing a very large role. Where is the magnesium actually? Is it the carbonate? Is it the organics? And all of this is folded into the question of precision. So my general question is, what, what precision do you think these proxies work, in your opinion? And what can we realistically reconstruct from what we need Okay, good question. Um, there's, uh, there's, some, there's maybe a number of answers, I think. What's the question? Oh, sorry, what's the question? Yeah, it's the precision of it. Yeah, the question is, what is the precision of magnesium-calcium ratios? Is that kind of more or less? Well, the, the, there's, a, there's a number of points. The first thing I, I would say is that um, um, you know, the proxies that have been developed, um, I would say that probably none of them measures one thing. And the, it's, it's that you know, we've been given somehow these microfossils, and what has been done is to, is to try and evaluate the extent to which they would give a accurate estimates of a particular parameter, in this case temperature. And another example would be something like transfer function approach, you know, where um, faunal abundances are used. And so the issue then is really, um, you know, what, what, what is the variability and, and can you, under you know, can you um, understand the causes of it. Okay, I'm, go, I'm, I'm going to go on at a bit of length here, I think. The, one thing then, you know, one answer would be, well, we don't know until we understand everything about forearm calcification. And there are some big challenges in understanding that. Now, I think if we waited until we could understand everything about formal calcification, we'd all be out of a job. And so, and, and I think the, you know, the tactics of groups, you know, and this is not something that's been um, uh, organized, but the fact that some groups are really interested in understanding, you know, how calcification works, and other groups want to go ahead and apply them. I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, a little anecdote about Nick Shackleton was that um, we had a conversation about calibration and so on. And he said, um, if I can remember exactly, I'm not sure exactly the words, he said, um, all you need to do is to give me a core top. Give me the data in the core top and I will tell you what the record's like. Now, of course, that's not true, um, particularly with high-resolution records. And I think what we have to do is to th like, think of the different components that, d that lead us to come up with an equation for a proxy or the effect of secondary effects. And we can, we can do that, and I tried to do it in one of the slides, where we can say that um, for benthic magnesium, we're pretty sure that there's a temperature control. We're pretty sure there's a carbonate ion control. There may be some other controls. But, but also for oxygen isotopes, there, that it isn't as simple as saying we know what the paleo temperature equation is. But what we can do is then kind of explore the, the results that we obtain by looking at the different sensi sensitivities in the equations. And uh, so maybe that's sort of one answer. I mean, another answer is that um, it, I would say it's not simply a matter of, say, taking one sample and comparing it with another sample and saying, the uncertainty is, is such and such. Because what, it, you know, what we do as paleoceanographers to think about things, not only in the sort of 
depth domain or time domain, but also in the frequency domain. And we can, we can find out, for example, you know, are the concentrations or the, the differences between concentrations you know, significant in different ways? Are they significant within eccentricity cycles? Are they significant in a record? You know, and I think you hinted at that. If you have a record that shows variations that show glacial interglacial patterns, I would say that we're on the right track. We may not know the right answer. And you know, if someone, if you were giving this lecture in five years' time, you might be then saying, well, we've now found that what Elderfield said about carbonate iron was rubbish. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's, how, that's how the thing works. So I'm, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing that we can, or not, you know, uh, you know I'm not saying that we can get exactly, the, you know, we're back t to Yuri, you know, who said, well, maybe if you have six degrees, you should be happy, you know, we we would like to have maybe one and a half degrees, two degrees. Okay. One more short question. Can you shout a bit more, David? Come on up, and Come up, David. Come on, David. <laughs> Come up to the microphone. I think it's hard for people to hear. I'm just so glad I didn't have to do this again. Um, the question is, when you separated the ice volume and temperature signal, I believe you had more of the sawtooth signature basically in the ice volume, and the temperature signal was rectified with that U shape. And that Shackleton 2000, as I recall, reached some of an opposite conclusion that the sawtooth was in the temperature. So I thought if you could comment on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. Okay. Is that, are you sure he said that? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mean it in that way. But I, I, I can't, my recollection of the temperature record, which is the one that I put a slide up, um, didn't really have sawtooth. I mean, I'm not sure it, it's, it, I'm not sure it's a step function. It, I mean, I, th I think I would say that it's not that accurate in the sense of, you know, as you know, he looks at differences between different residuals and so on, you know. So maybe we'll have to look at his paper. Um, I thought it, I thought it, the main thing I could see in it were rather, you know, we're basically eccentricity cycles. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe we'll, um, we'll look at it together. All right, thank you very much, and please help me uh, thank our speaker once again.